Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil Hubert. Today, I'm joined by special guest Dylan Baker, one of our designers, and one of our standard hosts, John Doyle. On today's episode, we will be talking about... I'm not sure what we'll be talking about. We'll come up with something. But anyway, I wanted to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Shaper Tools, makers of the Shaper Origin, the handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. Tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. Try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. All right. Before we get started on today's discussion, I wanted to address a listener comment that I got not that long ago. And it has to do with a little background art that I have in my office that I'm not sure how many people have seen or probably people don't care necessarily unless you're watching it on the YouTube version. But the listener saw this little item and Mm -hmm. wondered if I had any kind of a dairy connection, thinking that what that is is from the Holstein, the Holstein Association, if that's uh, the uh, representation of what the ideal Holstein cow, dairy cow looks like. Mm -hmm. And, and for those that are visually impaired or just just listening listening to the podcast, you you were holding up a figurine of a dairy cow. But this is no ordinary, I'll put a link, a photo and a link on our show notes page. This is no Mm -hmm. figurine. This is actually Mm -hmm. a toy, a version of one that I had as a kid called Milky the Marvelous Milking Cow. Okay. Okay. There it is, yeah. Uh, Kenner was all over the alliteration in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, So I do have a dairy background. My maternal grandparents owned a dairy farm, and I spent a lot of time as a kid uh, visiting grandma and grandpa and helping out as only kids can by probably getting in the way more than actually helping for all the various chores that are required at a dairy farm. Baling hay and picking stones out of fields and cleaning out the barn, feeding calves with bottles, and Mm -hmm. uh, basically being a nuisance, carrying milk buckets up from the barn to the pump house and all that kind of stuff. So... Well, plus you're from America's right. dairy land, right. too. So <laughs> being from Wisconsin, I'm a proud, proud member. Uh, but anyway, the Milky Toy, what it had is, uh, what you can do is you tip its head down, her head down, and she had a little manger that you've um, filled with water, and then you pumped <laughs> the tail on Milky. Wow. And Milky would drink the water. And then in the udder, you could remove the udder and put in these little tablets that once she was done drinking water, would turn the water white, and then it would come out of the udder, thus creating the magic of uh, a milking cow. Very cool. Yeah. Let's let's not understate the physique of that Holstein either. I mean, that's what I would say the equivalent of Michelangelo's right. David in the Holstein yeah. world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. no, these are very. It's a they're, very Rubenesque Holstein. So <laughs> anyway, so I, I had one as a kid. I don't know why I liked it, other than probably just because it resembled the cattle at my grandparents' farm. So. Mm-hmm. I found one in an antique mall, which made me a little sad a few years ago. So I keep it in my office here as a little connection to the past. Unofficial mascot of Phil's office. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So so, anyway, thanks. I don't remember who sent that in, but thanks for noticing. Dylan, 
it's been a while since we've had you on the podcast. But uh, maybe give a little update on what you've been working on recently. For sure. Yeah, I was getting a little worried. I don't know if it was because of the mishap last time when I, you know, accidentally didn't record the podcast. <laughs> so I, I mean, the the reason was valid, but again, I was getting, you know, I, I had my suspicions about why I was not being uh, asked to come right. back. So that or, that or I wasn't providing substantive mm-hmm. enough content. <laughs> that was probably our best podcast ever. To, <laughs> yeah, that was and, disappointing. And nobody, will get to, nobody will ever get to hear it. That's too bad. Yep. It's like the lost tapes. They'll all be yep. like posthumous, like releases of our podcast yeah. that no one ever heard. It's, and be... it, yeah, it's floating around the cloud somewhere. Right, right. We'll just never get to enjoy the financial reward of the <laughs> success of that podcast, yeah. their unreleased yep. podcast. What would have been? Um, boy, uh, loaded question, but um, I'll I'll take a stab at it. Um, other than working on lots of projects, um, and you know, just staying busy with you know. Keep, helping out with the magazine and video design and or editorial form. Um, I did have my editorial debut for Woodsmith, which I think a lot of people probably missed out on. I uh, designed, I'm trying to think, did I build that project too? I'm already forgetting which one it was. Is it the lamp? The yes. The scissor yes. lamp? Yeah, it was a scissor lamp. So I had the opportunity to design build and write an article for Woodsmith. So triple threat. Um, the tri- mm-hmm. yeah, the triple threat. It was good. It was uh, it was definitely a marathon, especially with, you know, having some other things going on, but it was not much of a departure from, you know, kind of what I've been doing with popular woodworking for the, you know, better part of a year, year and a half going on a year and a half now. So we just we do things a little different. So, but it was it, it was it was fun. Um I mean, I think it was kind of a necessary thing to just kind of see how the the wheels move here on the editorial side of things. And once they start getting passed around for proofing and, um, but no, it was a, it was a great learning curve. And I, I was glad to, you know, have the opportunity to kind of, you know, fill that void. We were in the process of hiring a new, um, assistant editor for Woodsmith. So, um, yeah, I had that. And I guess currently um, I am actually just finishing up another article for Popular Woodworking. I did a a shaker daybed last year, which I think ended up being kind of a a popular article, um, or at least at the very least got some positive feedback on. And so we went ahead and did a companion piece to go along with that, um, which we ended up doing a shaker side table. And Ironically enough, you know, it, it's funny, you know, you think about, or at least I've been thinking about the projects I did in college as part of my kind of a woodworking curriculum. And the shaker side table was one of the first, other than a, a small box, um, I think the shaker side table was actually maybe a second project I did. Um, and just looking back on it, you know, having the foresight that you do, um, it's, it's a really good introductory project to, I think, a lot of different types of uh, of very necessary joinery techniques in woodworking. So it's really not, you know, even if the shaker style isn't uh, a particular aesthetic or, you know, again, style of furniture that you gravitate towards. I think, again, if you're uh, an entry-level woodworker, even somebody that's been doing it for a while, it's just a really good exercise to kind of, one, or introduce yourself into some of the, uh, you know, joinery techniques and or hone pre-existing ones that you already have. Um, there's just a lot going on on it. Um, it does seem a little daunting at first just because it is, a, you know, it's a physical piece of furniture. It's not a smaller project, so it has presence. But again, there's just, uh, it has a lot of uh, elemental things going on to it. So it was kind of exciting to revisit it with fresh eyes and perspective. Um, and then just knowing at one point that I knew I'd probably, again, introduce a project I did in college into, into one of our articles. So, uh, but that's been fun. I've, I'm just uh, wrapping up the, I got my proofing back from copy editing, so I'm just kind of fine, fine tuning it and then I'll have that sent off today. Um, other than that, uh, what do I have coming up? We're uh, kind of working ahead or tr- attempting to work ahead John made the joke the other day about how we're days ahead, and we all had a nice chuckle about that. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, Chris and I are, again, always trying to stay at least one step ahead of the editorial staff, I, not just to say, ha ha, we're ahead of you, but it, it just it benefits everybody just to have things ready to go, um, not just from the design standpoint, but again, just having have, being able to pass the torch 
and having your ducks in a row for when that next issue rolls around. It just helps everybody out, especially with, you know, the busy schedules that we all hold and uh, kind of the new, the newer sure. roles we've we've kind of stepped into. So it just helps with continuity sake. But for 259, I am working on a Harvey Ellis piece, which I'm really excited about. Um, that will fall into our heirloom mm-hmm. category. Um, the kind of nice challenge with that is, you know, the heirloom projects are not always necessarily bigger, but they're kind of a reproduction a lot of times of a, a more traditional form. Um, the For this particular project, um, inlay is going to be kind of the driving or technique part of the article or what's kind of driving the, the editorial part of it. So I want to... Sure. I want to keep the form modest in size and not have it, you know, be a giant, um, you know, secretaire or a, a hutch. You know, again, I want to keep it at least mildly intimate in scale and just have the focus. It will be a little bit more on the the inlay aspect because it, it will be, be it will be involved and, and, and take some time. And so, that again, that's just one of the considerations we have to take into when we're designing and writing is page count. So I have that, and then I also have the good fortune of doing another kind of designer-inspired piece by a, a now-deceased uh, furniture designer, one of my favorite studio furniture designers, Wendell Castle. So we're going to do a stack laminated piece, um, just kind of based off some of the, again, stack lamination. Um, they did a lot of, like, brick laying. Um, but again, it's very strategic and just how the layout goes because you don't want to just build this thing out of solid, you know, complete solid wood. And so there's consideration to having hollowed out form. Um, you know, there's uh, the, the again, the system of how you stack your individual layers to get the general shape. And then, of course, there's a lot of shaping involved, too, with the combination of power and hand tools. So we're going to try and keep that on the smaller side. It'll probably end up being like a side table of some sort that would maybe uh, accompany a couch on either side. So you could make two. Um, But again, I want to at least make it as approachable as possible and just have that be a a technique driven um, article. I don't think we've done a lot of stack laminated carving stuff. So it'll be kind of a, a cool one to introduce. So that's right. what I have going on. I could keep talking about Pop Wood and Woodsmith, but I, I don't want to be the one running the show here. But that, that's kind of where my focus is right yeah. now. Well, since I have both of you on here as designers, and for the simple fact that uh, both of your formal education was related to woodworking and mine was not, uh, I merely went to writing communication school. So. Uh, I'm going to lean on you to just find out a little bit your work, both of your workflows, especially because here's what I'm thinking Um, for this first question, Dylan, you've done several shaker inspired Mm -hmm. pieces recently, both for popular woodworking and woodsmith. John, you've had your hand in several uh, stickly craftsman pieces how I'd like to hear from both of you how you look at designing uh, designing a reproduction because I think it's very easy for folk to think that it's just a matter of hey you look it up online it has length width height boom you're done mm-hmm. like what what goes into it to make you know to translate that project into something for popular woodworking or, or for woodsmith? Uh, I think you pretty much nailed it on the head. That's, <laughs> that's what it's all about. Just scale it from the picture. No. Now, there's a lot of um, kind of researching the joinery of that period or that that, that piece of furniture that that to kind of keep it, um, you know, in, in line with what they would have done. Um some of that period stuff. I mean, you're kind of stripping away modern hardware. And so there's a lot of, you know, with drawers and, and whatnot, it's like, how can you make it, uh, you know, take away the hardware and still make it functional for today's, um, user, uh, might be a lot of it. Uh, I don't know, uh, highlighting a lot of the, the, uh, what do I want to say the details, 
um, of that era as well as kind of some thought into it as well. But yeah, you know. I, I, it, it, it's it's difficult too when you're you know you're you're the the subscriber or reader and it doesn't necessarily have to be for our magazine. But you know, I, I think about this a lot, especially with you know when we're um, tasked with doing some of the heirloom pieces, or if it is a piece that it inevitably is inspired by a previous. Um, you know, either school of thought or, uh, you know, design. Um, but, uh, I, it, where was I going with this? No. Um, I am always amazed at, again, just how much research really goes into those pieces. Um, again, you could pull up a piece that you're doing a reproduction of. Again, it gives you maybe the, then the height, length and width, and that should be enough to go off of. Um, but really, you know, there's just so many other considerations that we have when we're building these things because not everybody's live or lives, you know, can have these giant pieces. So a lot of, a lot of it comes down to scaling and being just conscious of just the size and being, uh, respective of how things were built in that particular period. So, you know, you don't want to change the piece so much that, you know, you're just, using the word as a catch word and it really has nothing to do with the the specific period um you know so the proportioning like john said the joinery is super important um again how we treat that so the finishing application that's involved um so again there's especially with the heirloom pieces there's just a lot of i think historical research that goes into them and of course there's just such a large inventory within each one of those periods or styles too so it does really kind of come down to okay what piece is going to appeal to our reader um, or may not necessarily at first glance appeal to our reader, you know, but maybe there's something interesting about it that captivates them that they may not have known before uh, about that piece or about that style or period um, that we can use to kind of harness the, the interest level in, in those pieces. Um, and of course, again, like I mentioned about just working with projects in general, you know, we do have page count. We have to be respective of that. And if the designer isn't writing, which more times than not, they're, they are not, um, you know, you have to th just think about how you can break this piece down without, I say this a lot, without bastardizing the style, you know, and just kind of ripping the soul out of it too. So, you know, making the steps or sure. creating steps that, um, you know, an entry level or intermediate level woodworker could, you know, look at and be like, okay, well, this is something that I could build or would want to build for myself or someone else. So there's a lot more that meets the eye. Yeah. Yeah. I guess one thing that I would like to point out that I think is kind of interesting um, is I feel like there's, it's really easy to fall into the trap of just finding a couple of hallmarks of a specific design and then boom that's what it is so like how do you guys avoid kind of the pastiche approach in the sense like for john with the with the craftsman series that you've been working on where it's like hey you could just go to ikea buy a box mm -hmm. stick corbels make it look like quarter sawn white oak and boom craftsman style or with shaker style, it's like, I'm going to put a thumbnail mold and some mushroom knobs on here. Boom. <laughs> you know, shaker. You know, like, Yeah, I don't know. It's a pretty good question. I, uh, I guess with some of the stuff we do, like the, the Craftsman uh, pieces of furniture, it's all solid wood panels. We're not using any plywood, I think, other than the drawer bottoms for that. So there's, you know, some woodworking there with how you glue up the panels to get, you know, a good look with the grain and so that they don't warp and, you know, different woodworking techniques there uh, to make it a little bit more uh, substantial than, than the cheaper furniture you would buy. Um, sure. Like you said, at Ikea or even most furniture stores are going to, you know, cheapen it. They're going to use plywood or, you know, just to lighten it and uh, save costs just on a manufactured piece. Um, yeah, I don't know, just like some of the joinery as well is it's just going to be stronger than most furniture that that you can go out and buy. And and uh, I don't know, part of it's just the 
the enjoyment of, um, you know, making it and making it well compared to what you can buy outside of just the, the look that you would see in furniture stores. So, um, I guess I'll just dovetail off John. Um, I, you know, short of the shaker t- uh, table that we've been, you know, discussing, um, the shaker day bed I did last year is a great example of just how I, I mean, I like to find pieces that are, are categorically not uncommon, but they're a rare form of that particular style of furniture. Mm-hmm. Like that stuff interests me a lot more. Um, that particular piece was in a book, uh, the shaker legacy legacy by Christian Bexfort. And it was a reproduction that was just off one photograph. And as far as I know, it was really the only photograph that really exists of it, other than perhaps maybe on the Shaker Village's website that occupies that. Um, but also the story behind the piece, too, and just how it evolved completely out of necessity. So, I mean, the, like, the Shakers didn't have couches. I mean, it was just something that it, it ended up being a bed at one point that they added side rails to and a back a crest rail and called it you know it wasn't even considered really a couch it was just an early form of a couch Um, another great example is the rancho monterey piece we did recently i mean up until it was tasked with doing that i I had no idea what rancho monterey style furniture was and it's an american form of furniture you know that came out of the the kind of the mission or spanish revival um, era during the 30s and the early parts of the 40s Um, but just really i think the peculiarity of these pieces again just within categories that we may be familiar with or, or that we, we know of and just kind of doing the research and finding pieces that are just kind of rare in form that again the story or the, the aesthetic of itself is is the intrigue and kind of the the entry into um, you know luring people in and, and uh, just having them enjoy aspects that they aspects of the periods they may not have uh, you know known otherwise so I mean that's the part that I, that I enjoy and again that that stems from, you know, the more designerly pieces, but certainly even with the heirloom style pieces we do too, is just kind of, again, digging deeper and just seeing, you know, what else exists out there that we can, we can share with people. Well, what I think is kind of fun to see is, you know, having done the research that you guys did on different styles is, is almost having a freedom then to kind of play around in that sandbox, so to speak. And, come up with something that is both familiar and unique, you know, cause I'm thinking of that Monterey cabinet that we did. It It's very similar to mm-hmm. an existing piece, but I mean, you definitely made some changes in there that it's both familiar and different. Um, and John, like with that craftsman series, you know, it all started with that gentleman's dresser and then turned into a bed and a nightstand and a mirror and a smaller dresser now. Like, they all look like they belong together, but it's not like they were, you know, it's not like this was on page 48 of the right. Stickley catalog or something. Right. How do you then, as a designer, you know, to compare it to the world of, say, maybe food and restaurants, view project design where you're able to put your own spin on something instead of just cranking out quarter pounders with cheese, <laughs> you know, day after yeah. day. Yeah, no, like, you know, uh, where you are. we have, uh, I think it might be in the next issue 258. Uh, we hadn't done a weekend type workbench, um, that, uh, in a while. And I guess just uh, for that one, it, it I just had a unique perspective of here we've built a lot of workbenches. We've had the chance to work on a lot of different workbenches um, than most people. They would have maybe one or two in their lifetime. So uh, for that, I had the perspective of using a lot of different things and building a lot of different workbenches. So I pulled ideas from all of the workbenches I worked on. So like the top is similar to the, the one um, that you guys have in the, that, that you editors use. And I have a similar one at home that I've had built. And I'd also built the same one for my dad. So I knew that that MDF top was really easy to build and has lasted 
uh, and worked really well for me over the years. So I pulled that idea from that. And uh, the base was kind of based off the joinery of a picnic table that we built on the show this season. And then uh, the drawers that go under was based off the shaker workbench that we'd, uh, I think Dylan had used for a while and we built for issue 200 of Woodsmith maybe. And then some other I think so, uh, yeah. features that we'd um, built for workbenches um, over the years. So just, I guess, um, having a lot of experience with different pieces of furniture and looking at a lot of different things, you're pulling, you know, ideas from all that rather than uh, just being a, a woodworker and not having that experience with lots of different projects and uh, being uh, exposed to different designers that we've had here and seeing what other people are doing. So I guess that kind of lends a unique perspective or uh, having that community and, um, you know, just building lots of different projects over the years. So, you know, I, uh, I don't know. I, in the beginning, I, I think, I feel like I definitely struggled with just cause you know, I am one of those people that wants to reinvent the wheel and I know that's not really practical and it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily have to sure. be such a grand gesture either or something as profound as that. I, but I do really, I like to try and find ways to make things fun and interesting. Um, you know, in design school, they hammer you with, you know, finding, you know, your breadth of work and your body of work and, you know, what, conceptually like what's driving all this well it's like you know it's all it's a lot of different things um but woodworking is just such a practical thing and it's such a utilitarian thing and really that's what validates the art form of it for me is that it is functional it's not just something you hang on your wall and so there's really just kind of to me it's just there's just endless possibilities and we live in a time where we have just this tremendous access to I mean, especially in terms of like furniture, I mean, everything's at the, you know, you can Google just about anything you want. You know, there's um, auction houses that we use for inspiration. There's, you know, Etsy, right. there's other people's work. Um, and, you, and you're constantly surrounded by it. So, you know, you're, you're always inundated for better or for worse, but the, there's always going to be a story and there's always going to be something that, you know, drives again, whether it be a traditional form or be something completely new um, there, there's always going to be ways to kind of, um, I think, sustain yourself and, and find something that may or may not be um, an overlooked aspect of, of furniture design or, or woodworking or, or, or whatever. And so I think I, I take time, I just try and take time and, you know, remind myself of that. And, you know, again, we, we have this such great autonomy here to just kind of try things and strike out and experiment and, and that's, I don't know, it's, it's really advantageous for us, I think. And it's working. I think it's working extremely well and it's keeping people happy. So at the risk of sounding a little like we're patting ourselves on the back, <laughs> you know, there's, I feel like there's a temptation in our current business climate to focus group survey, uh, value engineer, everything that you do to ideally meet some need, perceived need from your audience or whatever. And I think what's really cool about the staff that we have now for Woodsmith is we have a genuine enthusiasm for woodworking, for building, for using tools well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we think of ourselves as representatives of the readers and viewers and with the idea that this is fun Mm -hmm. for me. And if it's fun for me, there's probably a large number of other people that are woodworkers that this would be fun for as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. And I I guess, you know, if, if the readers didn't know before, I mean, they should know now, again, we, we definitely are doing things with them in mind. I mean, you know, short of (laughs) concentrating on these focus groups and stuff, you know, we are generally trying to, you know, it it is a selfless thing. I mean, you know, it's hard not to feel like it's self-indulgent because we enjoy it, but, (laughs) but, um, we, you know, we, we are at the end of the day, we are putting out a magazine, we are creating, we're, we are creating content and we're doing it for other people. I mean, that is our business. And so, yeah. um, sure. that, that, that's always going to be our focus. 
it just so happens that you know our our hobby is our job and that's yeah rare in this world and you know again we like phil said or like you said phil um (laughs) we we are just kind of a motley crew but we are all are together and we all have such different backgrounds but we are all brought together by this you know this one this one thing and it's it seems to be working working well so you know one thing that i was i keep looking out the window here we have a thunderstorm system that's about to roll through the middle of iowa and there's been some pretty impressive cloud formations going through and it just got really dark and windy so it's not duratio 2.0 is it (laughs) no i don't think so but so for all the people who are watching this on YouTube and wondering why I keep looking out the window with a little bit of fear and trepidation. It's because of that. So, well, this podcast better get over uh, before I have to roll my windows up. (laughs) (laughs) So far, I think we're we're okay. Uh, you know, one thing that I was going to ask you, Dylan, as you were talking, uh, about, you know, your time as a design student, and this might be a very shallow, narrow view of it, but I, from an outsider perspective, sometimes I feel like designers, all they want to do is come up with something that's not the same as what happened or what has existed before. Yeah. And so what ends up is just some weird wackadoo, you know, carrot shaped footstool <laughs> right. or, you know, armchair that looks like a spider or something like yeah, that. Something that only belongs in like the a spread or lead shot of an architectural digest or on the front page of Core 77. <laughs> yeah, you know, we always used to joke, I won't say the school specifically, but there are some of those art schools out there that basically we, we would say that are conceptual to the point of dysfunction. And I think that sure. can ring true. And I always used to kind of joke too about, you know, there's there's a lot of this out there where these projects, they're absolutely beautiful and you know, they spent a thousand hours on them. But if you look, you know, if you really break that down, I mean, that's not, it's not really a practical way about, especially if you're trying to make it into a business, unless you can sell pieces for 30 or $40,000 a piece, which if you can, that's, that's great. I, I, I envy you, but um, you know, those pieces just aren't for everybody either. And I think it, it, I appreciate more the, the kind of the democratized version of woodworking. I mean, you can always do stuff for yourself, but again, at the end of the day, I'm, I personally am trying to share it with other people and making it work for other people and want people to know that it is an accessible hobby, uh, or craft or art form. Um, but again, in design school, yeah, a lot of times, and again, it's contingent on the school you go to, you know, I went to a a public university, not to say that that has anything to do with it, but typically with private institutions, you know, the the curriculums can be a little different. Um, But yeah, I always had a pretty practical approach. You know, I had a teacher that had a furniture business for a while. So, you know, he, he had that to bring to the table. He was also the product of, you know, going to the same undergrad school I did and then ultimately went to a, a private art school for, for his master's degree. Um, and then I had another professor who went to the College of the Redwoods, you know, the, the Cranoff School uh, in Northern California. And so, again, I kind of had a, a great uh, a marriage of teachers there and, and perspectives. And so I think I always had kind of, a, again, a, a practical approach to woodworking, although, I again, I still am Still, de- I'm definitely searching for something for me that I, that kind of drives the type of work, other than just the inherent interest to do so. Um, and you know, but uh, there is that 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 definitely exists, um, and it definitely it seems like it is more prevalent. But again, I think that really just has to do with people's accessibility to the internet. I mean, it's if you get on social media, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, whatever. I'm not putting either one of those down it's just it's a very like uh how do i say it uh best foot forward sort of kind of view of people's lives that aren't that's not really what they are there especially when it comes to a craft or somebody that's doing them for a living there's just so much behind the scenes work and i think it's easy for people to get disillusioned with you know people just thinking they're cranking out these beautiful pieces of work every day. That's just not the case. So, um, yeah, I guess I kind of am 
I'm losing traction here with where that original question or, or comment started. So <laughs> I'll just. Uh... Well, I think to, to kind of shift it a little bit, John, you said something a few weeks ago. Um, I think we were just reading through some reader email that had come in, some of it complimentary, some of it less than complimentary about the types of projects that we were offering. And, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about there's a tension in mm -hmm. the, t the range of projects that we have for something that's super involved, maybe more complex versus offering right. simpler projects, you know, and you were trying to make a case for, yeah, for those well, simpler projects. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we've kind of been through it all and we get, you know, bored with the simpler projects and we're trying to maybe overthink it sometimes and, and go bigger and go grander and, you know, top, top the previous project. And, and a lot of times people that are reading these magazines, this might be, you know, their start in it and, and they're just beginners and they want, um, you know, something simpler, something attainable where they can not just look at a grand project and be like, oh, I can never do that. Or, you know, that maybe someday, you know, you want to have projects that that are attainable where you can have successes and like, okay, I can build this project and this issue and, and you know, accomplish that. And then the next issue I'm on level two or level, you know, keep leveling up as you, as you're learning, um, the, the techniques and the joinery and, and whatnot on the smaller projects. And then, you know, start building up your, your repertoire and your skills, and then eventually get to those bigger ones. So I think it's good to have a variety of yeah. different styles and, and different sizes and attainability versus, you know, the big heirloom, um, you know, dream projects. So, right. But, and I was also thinking that in terms of uh, looking at what we're trying to accomplish in woodworking, you know, is it is it about furniture projects or is it, you know, being involved with the material and the skills and the craft itself? And I think this is where it helps with having the, the range of people that we have here is you know, we have people on staff that live in apartments. We have people on staff that are in their first home or a small home or whatever. And not everybody has the inclination to build a giant suite of furniture that all looks the same or has the space for a humongous bookcase, right. but they maybe need a wall hung bookshelf. I, I think it's easy for people you know. to you know, we're all victim of this, but I think it's easy for people to lose sight of the fact that we are still an entry to intermediate level woodworking magazine. Um, and that doesn't diminish what we're doing at all. It's just, that's, that's our focus. I mean, we don't, you know, every once in a while we do pepper in projects that we're probably closer to more an advanced thing, but that's all about, you know, again, providing a diverse range of projects, styles, but also, uh, skill sets and ranges. Um, but I think, you know, too, we're, I think we're responsible as well as, you know, designers and editors, too, to continue to expand the definition of what woodworking is as, you know, time and technology go on and just not completely cast off things that are new. You know, the CNC, I know, was something that was has, was talked about. I'm sure, I, I don't can't remember, but I'm sure you guys did an article years before we built the CNC machine for the magazine. Um but I, I just don't think really anything's completely right. off the table. And I think, again, I think part large, well, not a large part, but a part of our job, again, is just to kind of expand the vocabulary. And if you don't like doing it, then don't do that aspect of woodworking. But we want you to know that it's something that's available. It's something that people do. Um, if they're not doing it specifically, that specific thing all the time, it might just be an elemental part of you know, the bigger picture or the project or whatever. Um, and that's also something that keeps it interesting and fresh for us too, is just to kind of, again, um, explore the, uh, the innovation of woodworking as it progresses. And I think it's always fun to be able to hear from our readers, you know, who are interested in the topic and will suggest project ideas, mm -hmm. you know, whether we take it as is and design that project 
object that way in that thought, or if we, you know, fold it around and look at something that's related to it, you know, that it's almost becomes a conversation with the project at the center of being able to translate some of those ideas. And I guess that's how I kind of see you guys as designers, as being able to translate, say, an inspirational glamour shot that ends up in the magazine, whether it's the cover or the lead spread or something like that, but into something that people can say, oh, well, I can build that. Yeah, that's always... I don't know. That's that, I think that's always the challenge, regardless of you know how small or how large the project is. And again, that stuff can also be misleading or deceiving too. I mean, sometimes the smaller projects take take the most amount of I guess mental bandwidth to create because you know there's mm -hmm. there may be less components to work with. It might be smaller in scale, but um, boy, you know, trying to make it interesting sometimes. You know, you drag your feet and scratch your head and. Um, and sometimes those are their most, most difficult projects to, to do because you feel like there's, there's less to work with, but it also creates a pretty, you know, interesting challenge and opportunity for us to, to, uh, to work with those types of projects too. And just because they're small and scale and simple doesn't mean they're, they're easy either for the, for the build, for the builder. So, right. Yeah. You kind of alluded to the fact earlier about heirloom projects. Sometimes you have to scale back to get to to fit the page count sometimes on this, the smaller projects. I think I'm the next issue I'm working on is wall shelves is the, the topic. And it's like, okay, how do I not make that so simple that it's two pages and I need four pages. And so it's like, is it the design, the build, the technique, the finish that makes it interesting and, and gives you something to talk about and, and, and kind of expand from there. So. Yeah, some of the, the the smaller, simpler projects is is where the, the the details or the technique is is more highlighted. So you really have to you know consider that in, in the design. So those are a challenge as well. Right. All right. I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, if anybody who's listening has any comments or suggestions about project ideas for the magazine, I know Dylan and John both appreciate hearing from people on that uh if you have whether it's a, a category of furniture or a style or maybe a technique that needs to be incorporated into a project we'd love to hear from you you can send it in on the comments on our youtube channel where you can watch the visual version of this podcast otherwise if you're listening you can send in those suggestions to woodsmith at woodsmith.com Otherwise, I want to thank everybody for listening to today's episode. Just a reminder that it's brought to you by Shaper Tools, who make the Shaper Origin. It's the handheld CNC that brings digital precision to woodworking. The Origin allows you to tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, all of it with speed and precision. Try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. Thanks for stopping in, Dylan. And we'll see everybody next week on the Shop Notes podcast.